Well, hello YouTube, it's me Fortnaster, and welcome back to another Super Eye Patch Wolf video. And yeah, <laughs> social anxiety horror. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I I got no idea what that one's about. I mean, just from the title. I mean, I mean, but didn't we do? But didn't he do one about like? What was it? it? For some reason, that title just brings me back to his previous video of what is Nathan Fielder, where with the whole thing of just where Nathan Fielder stuff is kind of designed to put you in like a really awkward sort of state of mind and you know experience. But social anxiety horror. I mean, I, I mean, they have like of, of course his description isn't any help. Welcome to my deep dive into social anxiety horror. Enjoy or don't. It's a weird video. I mean, thanks for that. That really, well, not that literally doesn't help me at all. So, I mean, I got nothing really else to add to the beginning of this because I literally have no idea what I'm getting into with this video. Um, so, I guess we should probably just start this. <laughs> So, of course, um, this is going to be a multi-part video, so of course, uh, you can find the link to the second part, uh, both in the description and, you know, the end of the video when that happens. Also, links to the original video will also be in the description, as well as corner video will, you know, link to my Let's Play of the Day, as well as the second part. You know, I, I like to cover my bases with links, because, you know, I like to keep my keep my bases covered, um, simply because I usually like to, you know, imagine that, you know, I, at least I'm the lowest common denominator, so, you know, I... <laughs> But yeah, with all that out of the way, let's get this thing started. I want you to imagine that you're sitting alone in a room full of strangers. You're here oh, Nathan, because great. you feel like you come across as awkward, not very social, and that this comedy workshop might help that. You're nervous, but... The man teaching the class seems friendly, as do your fellow classmates. And you take comfort knowing they're all here for the same reason you are. The class begins and your instructor proposes an exercise. One by one, each person around the room must, without words, do something to make the rest of the class laugh. And, oh god, you're, you're, you're going to embarrass yourself. You don't want to do this. But you notice, as each person around the room pulls a silly face or strikes a funny pose, they're rewarded not only by the encouragement of the instructor, but with a polite smattering of laughter from the rest of the room. And soon, people are smiling, having fun. It's still embarrassing, but it's like, through this embarrassment, you're all in this together. You're a group, and... That's what you tell yourself as your turn draws near. Okay, two things. One, I mean, I'm I think I may be seeing where this is going to be going. And given that, you know, Nathan is going to be the topic of discussion once again. Um, two, though, think of it, you know, my whole thing is like I when it comes to this whole situation of, you know, being part of the crowd and stuff like that, I mean, I guess with, like, anybody, it's always been whatever, you know, why is the group together? I mean, when it comes to, like, a family, like, of course, yeah, I don't feel, you know, that, you know, outsider or whatever you want to call it, like, at a family get-together. But I'll, I'll talk to people if they ask, I'll ask how they're doing, you know, all that, you know... You, in the end, and the grand scheme of things, you know, meaningless chatter. But at the same time, like, I'm very much the kind of person where I'll just kind of, like, sit by the, uh, the sidelines and just listen to other people talk about their sort of what's, what, see what's happening on them. Just, you know, just passively observing what's happening in the family. I mean, the only time that that really gets, you know, put aside is, you know, if I have something to talk with somebody about and... I mean, for example, like, at the last birthday we went to, at my grandfather's birthday, I was with my cousin's fiancé, and we were talking about Fallout. We were talking about Fallout, uh, Fallout London mod that just came out, and he had just gotten back into Fallout 76, as well as uh, watching, like, the Fallout TV show. We were talking about potential, like, our own regions, about, like, if... If we were to make our own regions where a fall game would take place, like, what would be, like, the history and the backstory? What would be the groups there? You know, all that sort of stuff. Because he was thinking of potentially making, like, not like a, a, like, not like a D&D &D game, but, like, a tabletop uh, session or game, like, you know, in Fallout. So it's, a, it's all a matter of who you're with, really. 
All you have to do is something silly and everyone will laugh and you'll just be part of the group. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I, I get what the social anxiety horror is. It's secondhand embarrassment. That's that's exactly what it is. No one thinks what you did was funny. The silence that follows becomes an infinity. Yeah, yeah. Hello. There's some uncomfortable about this scene, isn't there? Yes, yes there is, Super Eye Patch Wolf Steve Jobs! But what is it? Is it embarrassment? Is it cringe? Or is it perhaps something a little deeper and more complicated? I mean, when he gets down to it, there's nothing more complicated than cringe. Especially secondhand cringe. <sighs> it just gets- it eats at you. I don't want to start this video off with too much of a Bombshell, but I am not the most socially competent person. I am in fact exactly as socially adept as you'd expect from someone of whom a major life turning point was wrote a bunch of anime video essays. Social scenarios <laughs> scare me. They fill me with a dread I can only convey through this image. <laughs> Very occasionally, I will encounter a special piece of horror that bumps off that fear. One that creates a subtle, crawling terror that everyone around me despises me in which I can hear the faint screech of a Nokia 3210 message alert. Why? Why does that blasted sound haunt me? This clip. You know, I believe I may have just found the reason why I usually just listen to what other people are talking about now. Thank you, Super Eye Patch Wolf is one of those pieces, but make no mistake, it is merely the diving board from which we will plummet into the abyss of social anxiety horror. And if you're wondering just how deep and disturbing this abyss can be... <laughs> Literally bottomless! <laughs> very... It can be very disturbing. And if I was to begin to show this, I would arrange for you three short tales of social anxiety terror. Oh no, three? Which, 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 is, which is what I have done. Fear of perception. A girl sits in class clearing notifications from her phone when she notices Ah, uh, okay, I've never seen this anime before, but given how it's all, given the technology and everything with so the stylus, this is probably early to mid-90s before, you know, true touchscreens really became a thing. The, the room around her has fallen silent. She looks up and sees her teacher, who's just standing there, staring at her, the woman's face frozen in this eerie, empty expression. In fact, it's everyone. Everyone is just silently staring at her. Uncomfortable, the girl leaves, only to find the people in the hallway outside also standing silently, staring at her, their faces locked in the same blank expression. No matter where she looks, all she sees is a mass of dead eyes boring into her, trapping her in this strange nightmare where she is just endlessly perceived. What is that from? Fear of humiliation. Well, I mean, th thinking of it, like, that first one, like, it's not so much, you know, fear of being perceived. 
But it's... It's also the fear of being, like... Of being the odd one out. Like, I, I don't know what, you know, a more concise way of putting that would be. But, I mean, if you have everybody staring at you like that, it either means you've done something really wrong, or you are, like, monstrously different than everybody else. So, I mean, that's part of the reason why, like, well, I can't think of a specific horror film or something like that, but I, you know, it's, it's appeared in a couple where, like, you'll see, like, the one person who isn't affected by something, and then they'll have, like, some sort of tell that they're not infected, so to speak, and then all the people who are infected will just stop what they're doing and just turn and look at them like, they're an invader. Or, you know, also, like, um, um, I'm like, that's Inception. It also gets in the whole thing of, like, Inception, where when you were in somebody's mind, if you did something, if you did things that were, like, too weird, the person's mind would notice that you were interfering, and essentially their mental antibodies would come after you. Uh, actually, yeah, that, that does fall into the whole thing of fear of perception. Okay, yeah, never mind, ignore what I just said. Humiliation, yeah. Uh, fear of humiliation. Is this going to be the whole, like, classic one of, you know, a person, like, dreaming that they're in school in just their underwear or something like that? Because, like... Thinking, I don't think... No, I never had an underwear dream. Um, again, my dreams were usually pretty weird. I think the... I think the closest to that was, you know, of course there was the odd... I think it happened, like, twice, if I remember correctly. But, like, I accidentally called the teacher mom or something like that. Like... That, I think, would, I think that's the worst it ever got for me. Ichi sits in class, having just returned from recess, and unbeknownst to everyone around him, he's just done something he shouldn't have. See, Ichi is the school's star baseball player and most popular oh God, what's class, he done? and about to run for student president. However, a strange report has been swirling. Student president, so you're saying basically a completely worthless position. Despite what anime will generally show. Despite what anime usually says. ...around town. A boy with a bent baseball bat is attacking people at night, whose description runs suspiciously close to Ichi's. Ichi watching as his once gleaming reputation corrodes under the weight of the rumors that he is the one doing these awful things. Oh my god, what is this called? I've se I've watched this one before. Oh god, I'm forgetting what it was called. It had the it had the weirdest theme song for the show. Ah, it's gonna be bothering me. I mean, hopefully, a wolf says it. But yeah, I've seen this one before, and it was like the the kid was like some sort of like spirit or something that grew stronger than more people talked about or something like that. It was weird. And did she knows just where those rumors are coming from? Oshi. Oh, the other boy running in the student election. So Ichi has no choice. He lures Oshi behind the school where he screams at him, insulting Oshi's weight and assaulting him, demanding he stop doing this. But Oshi, through tears, says he doesn't know what Ichi's talking about. Afterwards, Ichi sits in class only for his phone's message alert to sound. And that's when in horror, he sees it. Someone was recording what happened behind the school. And if this gets out, everyone will think the rumors are true. Ichi's reputation will be ruined. Why did the teacher allow literally every student to have their cell phone? Fear of paranoia. Mr. Organ is a 2022 documentary in which filmmaker and journalist David Freer begins to investigate a string of unusual incidents at the center of which seems to be a man known as Mr. Organ. The more David tries to Organ in what sense? Like internal organs or musical organ? Or are we dealing with a with an organ grinder that grinds organs? To find out about who this person is, the more 
wrong everything starts to feel. People David interviews become panicked and frightened when Mr. Organ is brought up. They warn David to stay away from him, some even refusing to speak to David, asking their names be left out of the documentary. And soon, David begins to notice property disappearing from around his home. He starts to receive long, unhinged phone calls and can't shake the creeping sensation that he is being watched. Mr. Organ has noticed David, and the two begin to form a bizarre relationship filled with vague threats and subtle psychological manipulation, culminating in a phone call where Mr. Organ tells David, You need to be more careful about the people you allow into your personal life, because one of them has reached out to me, a stranger, and provided me a key to your home. You're watching this and it's like, this can't be real. This has to be another attempt by Mr. Organ to scare David until Mr. Organ agrees to return the key. And when David tries it in his lock, it actually works, creating this moment of nearly surreal paranoia. David having to come to terms with the fact that someone in his personal life may wish him some strange harm. Okay, I, I mean, I was... Uh, fear of sick t-shirts? What? Um, but, okay, before my I got derailed by that, um, that is absolutely terrifying. Oh, God. I mean, this is why... Uh, you only- this is why you have multiple locks on your doors with multiple keys. Also, but it has to be someone who had his key to begin with, so it would have to be somebody really close. That's- okay, mm. Don't like it. Chat, let me ask you a question. Do you ever wanna just- Oh! Hurt someone? Okay, this is about his merch. Okay, I get it. You've all seen that humiliating footage of Krell, right? Can you imagine thinking you're so strong and cool, and then one day just BAM! That happens? And then some little angel films it, and uploads the vid for the whole city to see? I don't know about you guys, but I would actually want to die, like actually. Like crawl into the gutter and never show my ugly face again. So, you want to know what I say, chat? In honor of the little skank's long overdue downfall, I'm going to be dropping a very special merch run. Featuring not only that pathetic waste of skin at her absolute worst, but also our girl Damage, who we can all thank for bringing that disgusting crow crashing down to Earth. Okay, so you realize a stream like this, somebody's going to be recording this. This is admissible as evidence. Why are people so stupid in the age of the internet now? over to Pronto. Okay, that last one was actually the announcement for my new run of merch <laughs> for my fake anime slash video game Eyepatch Wolves, including a new piece of the clown girl everyone seems weirdly into. But uh, hey, look, no judgment. But seriously, yeah, seriously, why are why is there such an attraction to clown girls like? Why? Thanks to everyone who heads on over to oh. iPatchWolves.com. Uh, YouTube will probably demonetize this video, so thank you for keeping me alive. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try and be spooky again, so just just give me a sec here so it's not jarring and... Uh. I'm hoping from these stories you're starting to get a sense of the particular kind of horror we're talking about. This subtle, insidious dread that isn't violent or supernatural, but one that merely haunts... Well, the second one was sort of supernatural. Again, like the whole, like, kid with the baseball bat. Like, that was... There was something weird going on with that. I don't remember what specifically, but there was something weird. Once the spaces between you and other people. 
And I chose these particular clips because I think each one shows that idea through a different lens. Perception, humiliation, and paranoia. These are the three building blocks of social anxiety horror. And when you find someone who really knows how to use them, it can create a distinct kind of terror unique to anything else. A small town in rural America. The villagers move through a morning that should be like any other. However, it isn't. Today is the day of the lottery, an annual tradition that draws the villagers to the town square. And as per usual, oh God, a gathering lottery, that's alive never good. with chatter as children play and collect piles of stones. The chatter continues until a man carrying a black wooden box emerges and takes his place in front of the large crowd as the hushed voices turn silent. After a brief roll call, the man begins to list out the names of the villagers, starting at the A's and working all the way down to the Z's. And as he does, one by one, each villager comes to the front of the crowd and picks from the black box a small slip of folded white paper and without checking it, take their place back beside their family. Once all the villagers have a piece of paper, the man with the black box tells them to open it, and as they do, pockets of relief can be heard throughout the village, each and every person revealing to the people around them that their paper is stark white. Well, every uh -oh. villager except one. One woman opens her paper to reveal that it is not blank, but instead stained with a jagged black smudge. People begin to move away from the woman, and as they do, she begins to rant and rave. This isn't fair. This isn't right. She, she didn't have enough time to pick her paper. Her objections are cut short when a stone smashes her in the side of the head. And then they were upon her. What was that from? What I just read is an abridged version of a short story called The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, who we will come to know as the grandmother of social anxiety horror. Jackson was born in 1916 and in time would stop being a baby and begin writing strange horror stories. She in time stopped being a baby. Yeah, yeah, it seems pretty accurate. <laughs> I mean, I'd be more worried if, you know, there's somebody who didn't stop being a baby. Strange because they featured no ghouls or ghosts, but merely the quiet terror of small towns and vicious whispers. Sometimes her stories are so subtle and strange, it's almost hard to tell where the horror is coming from. And yet they're effective because they're built around these more social fears. For example, a woman walks the streets of New York. She's been tasked by her employer with delivering a package. However, she can't help but notice something unusual. The city's walls are covered with strange posters, each one with screaming red letters that read, Find Miss X. The person that does promised a range of ludicrous prizes. A trip to Tahiti, a private yacht, a pearl necklace. The woman ignores the posters and goes about her day, but as she does, a truck with speakers begins to follow her, and from it blares a voice. Find Miss X for a range of fabulous prizes. She's currently walking alone in the city. She's wearing a blue suit, a blue hat, a red coat, and carrying a single package. Shocked, the woman stops. I'm wearing my blue hat. I have on my red coat. I'm carrying a package. That's me he's talking about. Mortified, the it's woman really quickens her weird. pace to get away from the truck, but the deeper she goes into the city, the more it seems to surge with madness and excitement over this bizarre contest. She finds herself surrounded by massive Miss X billboards. It's on the front of every newspaper and its flyers cover every lamppost. All what describing is this? her. Feeling the eyes of everyone around her, the woman ducks into a shop where she buys a grey hat, stowing her old blue one in a hat box, which 
does mean carrying two boxes, but it's worth it to avoid the embarrassment. Uh -huh. She makes her way back out onto the street, only to encounter a grotesquely massive parade for Miss X, from which a man with a microphone bellows to a frenzied crowd, Miss X has swapped her blue hat for a brand new grey one and is now carrying two packages. She is still wearing her red coat. Find Miss X. This story is titled Nightmare and notice how eerily similar it is to the scene we talked about from Lane. I mean, admittedly, there is a bit difference, uh, given that there is something, something that's calling attention to her for some reason, and given, I mean, before you can kind of, like, with this one, you can kind of point towards, oh, there's something wrong with them, um, in this one, you'd have to be more, uh, more afraid of just, you know, bog-standard human nature, because you know that there's going to be some people that take finding Miss X a little too far, and that could be dangerous. And that's because they're both drawing on the same morbid fear of being perceived. A fear so fundamental and primal that it has a name, scopophobia. And you likely have felt some shred of scopophobia at some point in your life. The anxiety of performing on stage, the fear of giving a presentation, the horror of thousands of dead-eyed strangers watching your YouTube video, oh god! Well, we don't know when Jackson wrote Nightmare, it was likely sometime in the 1940s, but despite the near 100 years since its creation, I think it's kind of incredible how resonant that fear still is. Very much so, yes! special about Jackson's work. She captures these timeless anxieties that are as relatable now as when she wrote them. And fear of perception isn't the only one. Hey, so this next section contains descriptions of people being horrible to a dog, and I know that's especially upsetting to some people, so skip here if you would rather just avoid it altogether. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, I love you. I hope you're enjoying the video. Early one morning, really a woman receives a phone call from an irate farmer's wife. Her dog, who is normally quiet and well-behaved, has been seen savaging the farmer's chickens. The wife demanding that now that the dog has a taste for chickens, the woman will have to do something about it. To straw, the woman goes from what? neighbor to neighbor seeking advice, only to discover that they've already heard about the incident and that they all agree with the farmer. Humiliated, the woman tries to reason with them, but it's like her feelings don't matter. Like everyone around her has already reached some kind of morbid consensus and ignore her. We can't have a chicken killer in the community. Some even taking some strange glee in the suggestions as to what she must now do with the dog. Some speak of tying dead chickens to the dog and letting them rot till the dog has become traumatized by the smell. Others Ugh. suggest letting a mother hen claw the dog's eyes out, but most have a simpler solution. Just kill the dog. Kill your dog. One neighbor suggesting she tie a loose chained bladed collar around its throat, let it run as fast as it can in an open field before yanking the chain as hard as you can, ripping the dog's head from its body. This story is called Renegade, and even by Jackson's very high standards, it is strange, morbid, and cruel. No, but that is horrible. A story about a village that is mean to a dog, which is a kind of horror I want no part in. But I think <laughs> at the core of this story is the idea of humiliation. Humiliation in modern parlance usually means extreme embarrassment, or like that time my accountant looked up my Muramasa and the Demon Blade Kongeku figure before stating in cold monotone, I don't think this is tax deductible. But the <laughs> actual dictionary definition of humiliation is to have one's social standing lowered in the eyes of others. And that yeah, that, that, that works out. That's pretty much the most bog standard boilerplate, you know, uh, version of humiliation I can think of. That's exactly what we saw in the clip of Paranoia Agent from earlier. Paranoia Agent, that's what it's called! As Thank well you. as this story. 
The woman doesn't want to do these awful things to her dog, but has also been humiliated to the point that she no longer has the social standing to push back against them. The story's title, Renegade, literally meaning a person who betrays the beliefs of an organization or community. Mm -hmm. I know that's two dictionary definitions in the one paragraph, but words change meaning over time, and I, I thought their original context was important. Yeah, Look, I'm not reaching yeah. to make a point. You're reaching to make a fucking point! Final story of Jackson's I want to talk about of course, begins of with course. a woman waking on the morning of her wedding, ecstatic to be marrying the dashing man of her dreams. Only, there's a problem. This man has disappeared. Panicked, the woman searches all over town, asking, has anyone seen her fiancé? But most people act like they don't know where he could be. She traces his they steps back to an like... old apartment building, which he was seen entering, holding a bouquet of flowers. Not wanting to acknowledge what this might mean, she enters the building, but finds only a strange locked door, behind which she can hear a low, distant laughter. Her fiancé's laughter. She bangs on the door, praying that her fiancé answers, praying that he can explain all this away, but he does not. No one answers her cries. Day after day, the woman returns to the door, hoping to find her lost fiancé, and people laugh at her and mock her, but no one ever answers the door. The I mean, at that point, it sounds like she may want to just either learn lockpicking or hire a locksmith or something like that. The story is titled The Demon Lover. There's two things that the really get me lover. about this story. And the first is the crawling sense of paranoia and the woman's slow realization that this person she thought she knew actually has this awful capacity to do her harm. Much like the realization David faces in Mr. Oregon when the key slides into his door. The paranoia that the people around us may not be who we think they are. The second is there's something about this story that just feels so jagged and cruel. Something that Very I only so, started yes. to understand when researching into Jackson's personal life. Jackson's husband was a notorious adulterer. A fellow oh, writer, he would frequently no. sleep with his own students. Other writers, people Jackson would have known. And well, oh. I can't say for certain, it sure feels like that anxiety, that paranoia, is what Jackson was drawing upon in this story. But that's, horrible. that's what Jackson did. Jackson was raised by deeply traditionalist socialites who took issue with both her fluctuating weight, introverted nature, and love of writing. According to her brother, their mother was a deeply conventional woman who was horrified by the idea that her daughter was not going to be deeply conventional, the kind of person oh, to whom there was course. nothing more frightening than the disapproving whispers of neighbors. That's the fear Jackson grew up alongside, and Wa is so palpable in her writing. Jackson Jackson drew her horror from the simple social anxieties she experienced every day, and I think that's a big part of what's so powerful, not just about her own work, but about social anxiety horror in general. Most of us don't know what it's like to encounter the kinds of scenarios we see depicted in horror movies, but social anxiety horror does not grant us that luxury. As fear of being perceived, or humiliation, or feelings of paranoia, we touch off those every day. Mm -hmm. Doll's story, like the lottery does, is take those fears and accentuate them into this Amplify them. beautiful and brutal piece of terror. How Jackson likely saw the world. So there is us, and there is the society yeah. around us. And at any moment, the connections between the two might snap, letting us plummet into freefall. But the lottery is just a story. It's not like anything like that could ever actually happen, right? Oh god, we're going to do we're going to be seeing something in the Middle East, aren't we? <laughs> right? It's 2004. 
a fast food restaurant in Mount Washington, America, the supervisor of which has just received a strange phone call from a police officer. One of her employees has been monitored by his surveillance team carrying drugs and stealing from customers. The officer has the restaurant's area manager on the other line, and they've decided that for the sake of everyone, they'll need the supervisor's help to handle this as delicately as possible. Reluctantly, the manager takes the girl into a back room and tells her that she she's going to need to search her belongings. And the girl acts like she doesn't know why this would be necessary. And when the manager finds nothing, the officer insists that the girl is definitely carrying drugs and now she'll need to be brought down to the station, arrested and strip searched. Or it might be easier on everyone, including the girl, if the supervisor carries out the search herself. Oh. Okay, one, I'm very- I'm calling it now, that's not a real cop. And two, I'm like, I don't care if I was in her position, I would not go through with that. Just for the simple fact that they're the ones that are paid to do that sort of stuff. I'm not going to do that sort of thing. It's literally their job to enforce the law, so do it. The girl is appalled and upset. She claims she hasn't done anything, that none of this is necessary. But upon speaking to the police officer, he tells her that by resisting, she's making this more difficult for everyone else, and that even if she's innocent, it will be easier for all involved if she just complies. Eventually, the employee gives in. Her clothes and phone are taken away, and she's searched head to toe. And this all happens in front of multiple other employees, some of whom even take turns watching and searching her. And some object, but no one does anything. Nothing is found, but rather than the ordeal ending, things only grow more bizarre. It's like everyone who speaks to the officer falls under some strange spell, and slowly, the things he asks them to do grow more specific and cruel. The girl is left naked for hours. She is forced to do jumping jacks. She has her body inspected and described by multiple different people, is subjected to humiliating cavity searches, she is insulted, she is beaten, and she's forced to endure things I can't even talk about this video. It's like in the eyes of the people around her, the people she sees every day, she's stopped being a person all under the careful instruction of this faceless police officer. Eventually, the supervisor decides to phone the area manager directly, and when she asks him about the investigation, he has no idea what she's talking about. Called it! Please, please, God. Please, this, let this not be an actual story. Please tell me somebody wouldn't be so stupid to do something like this and not check with their higher-ups personally first. He hasn't heard from any police officer. In horror, the supervisor hangs up the phone. What I just described is the plot to the 2012 film Compliance. Oh... Oh, thank God, it wasn't real. It was just a movie. Oh, God, that was trying to stress me out there. Oh. It is a bizarre idea for a movie. A group of fast food workers fall under the strange hypnosis of some unknown figure on the other end of a phone. But maybe the strangest part is that this actually happened. I'm sorry, the story is what? based off an incident that took place on April 9th, 2004 in a Mount Washington McDonald's. Minor details aside, this all happened to a real victim committed by the people she worked with and trusted. There's even recorded security footage of the entire ordeal, as well as interviews with the McDonald's staff as they struggle to explain their actions. And where this...
has the video up on there. I'm sorry, I just needed to get something to clear my head. The fact that people would just blindly follow what somebody, just a, a random somebody on the phone sent do that. Like, like, honestly, how stupid stupid were they one i mean the whole thing of like oh no show me the badge you know to prove two who's ever heard of it's like oh it'll be easier if you do the the strip search for us <sighs> i Uh, I'm sorry, that that took like five years off my life right there. This gets even more bizarre is that this is not the only time that this happened. A near what? identical incident took place at a McDonald's restaurant in Saybrook Township, Ohio. And also a Pizza Hut in Starkville, Mississippi and also a Burger King in Fargo, North Dakota, a pizza parlor in Blackfoot, Idaho, a McDonald's in Letchfield, Kentucky, a restaurant in Charlestown, West Virginia, a Burger King in Indianapolis, a McDonald's in Iowa, a Taco Bell in Statesboro, Georgia, an Applebee's in Davenport, Iowa, a McDonald's in Hinesville, Georgia, a Taco Bell in Juneau, Alaska, and many, many more. Over 70 different incidents were reported across the US from 1992 to 2004, all following the same pattern, an anonymous phone call from someone pretending to be a police officer who over the course of several hours convinces a group of people to turn on one of their own. How? How? I mean, I, I generally like to think of myself as a trusting person. Like, you know, trust the law, trust in stuff like that. But, like, even, I, even I'm not so stupid just to blindly follow what somebody says over the phone. I get enough scam calls as it is. I think the temptation in hearing a story like this is to say that that could never happen to me. How gullible were these people? Exactly. However... I don't think this was a question of intelligence. Louise Ogborn, the original victim we talked about, was ranked top 10 in her high school and about to attend pre-med. The sheer volume of other people this has happened to makes it feel less about one person's intelligence and more like some strange exploit in the fundamental nature of how we are. Which brings us to a question. What the fuck actually happened here? Exactly! Two studies that may immediately answer that question are the Milgram Electric Shock Test or the oh God, yeah, those. Prison Experiment. However, Milgram's findings have been recently drawn into question over issues in how he collected his data, and the Stanford Prison Experiment has widely been proven to be about as legitimate as my marriage to Rouge the Bat. However, <laughs> there is another study we can look to, one that arguably has even stranger implications in what that fundamental exploit might be. Oh, also, listen, I want to stress up front here that parts of this video bump off different avenues of social science, which I am not any kind of expert in. I have put a lot of work into understanding those concepts and representing them as best I can, but this video should not be taken as anything but a silly YouTuber talking about things they think are interesting. You know, for some reason, that just makes me even more terrified, Wolf. I don't, and just, okay, so, granted, I mean, I'm thinking this before, you know, the potential theory of why this was even physically possible has been said, but I, I can't help but feel I, and I, and I know, it, like, I'm talking about myself here, so I might be t pulling, take, talking out of my butt, but I, 
I can't help but feel that I wouldn't fall for this, mainly because of my Asperger's. Like, my whole thing for my entire life has very much been, I've always been like a very goody two-shoes. When it's come to somebody who goes in trouble, I go to who's ever in charge to, to, so they can, you know, go through the process of, you know, punishing them or, you know, always following the rules. Something like that would not, it, saying rubbing, rubbing me the wrong way, that doesn't, it'd be like me rubbing my face into an active belt sander. Like, oh, just saying it's police. Oh, and you got to do this. It, it, two, uh, there's the whole thing of, you know, it's like, it's not my job. You, the police, come here and do this. So, so I, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to say more, but I physically can't think of more stuff to say on the topic. Because it's like my brain is shorting out just trying to comprehend that this is even physically possible. That's all. Okay, let's begin. You have chosen to take part in a study at your local college, where you must match the line on the left with the corresponding line on the right, designed to test people's ability to visually approximate length. The first slide is simple, the answer is two, and you feel assured in that conclusion when everyone before you answers two, 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 and two. The next question comes and... huh. This one's a little trickier, but after a moment, you can see the answer is three. But it's here that something unusual happens. The person at the top of the table answers one. Oh, that's unfortunate. He made the same mistake you nearly did. But then the second person answers one. Wait, did they both get it wrong? The third person also answers one. One. What, hang, hang on, are they are they looking at the same test you are? The final person before you gives their answer also one. Okay, wh what is happening here? How could they all be wrong? Are they all wrong or? Okay, so that's how this experiment works. Only the last person, the, the last person in the chain is the actual test subject. It's all down to peer pressure. Which, I mean, thinking about it, probably, again, just going back to the whole thing with me having Asperger's, I can't help but think that I would not fall for this. Again, I'm tooting my own horn here, so, you know, take everything with a massive heaping of salt. But, I mean, I've... When it comes to stuff like this, I've never been... Un unless it's been, like, a test, like, you know, for grades, at which points I've always liked getting good grades. But, like, when it comes to something like this, where it's just, like, pure like, perception or personal taste or something like that, I've never really been afraid of really sticking out, especially with something like this, which is so non-controversial or something like that. I mean, if that if that makes any sense, I hope I'm making sense of what I'm saying this. Or is there something here that you're not seeing? If you give a different answer and you're the only one to get it wrong, you're gonna look foolish. But if you're right, will the other participants think you're arrogant? Your breathing quickens. Think you're arrogant? What? Your chest tightens. The room awaits your answer. What I just described is from a 1956 psychological study called the Ash Conformity Experiment. There was actually only one genuine participant in this study, the rest mm -hmm, being yeah, actors that's what instructed I to purposefully give the wrong answer in a test conducted not to measure line length, but a person's willingness to conform to a group. And the result was that a shocking number of people were willing to give the incorrect answer even in cases when the lines differed more than six inches in length. And when interviewed as to why they did this afterwards, some genuinely believed they had made a mistake and that the group could not possibly be wrong, while others knew they were giving an incorrect answer but felt it more important to conform to the group. The results of the Ash Conformity Experiment have been replicated across dozens of different studies and variations, to the point that it's even become a popular format for hidden camera prank shows. In one example, oh God, a person yeah, the, enters uh, an elevator the elevator, actors, right. all of whom are facing the wrong way, looking away from the door and staring into the back wall. The person might face the right way initially, but you can see the discomfort this causes them. 
until eventually they succumb to the invisible social pressure and turn to face the wrong way like everyone else. In yet another more extreme variant of this, a woman oh, enters no. an optometrist's office, again populated with actors, all of whom have been instructed to stand to attention whenever a bell sounds. The participant doesn't know why this is happening, and you can see the look of confusion on her face as it does, until eventually she also begins to stand for the bell. Okay, well, this one I could potentially see making a little bit more sense just because something like that especially something as man-made as you know a bell ringing that could very i could very much see that as being just some sort of weird i could very much see that being like just some weird procedure that's having to go on and you know, you know given that she was the last to come in she you know obviously wasn't there for you know whatever the explanation of whatever that procedure was now again if this was me i'd very much you know ask the other people why they were doing that in the first place because I generally like to know why I'm doing something. But what's really interesting is what happens from here. Not only will the participant continue to stand for the bell even when all actors have left the room, if other non-acting participants are then funneled into the room one by one, what you will eventually be left with is a room full of regular people all uniformly standing to the bell with no idea as to what the bell is or why they are doing this, as was observed in a study by Cornell University. You know, the more I watch this, the more I realize I should try to get myself into more of these studies just so I can throw in my weird and random thought process in them to completely throw off their data. <laughs> What I find so unsettling about these experiments is that they show, as much as we might like to pretend otherwise, we love to conform. So much so that we will do things that we know are wrong. Love to conform? I, again, I, I can't help but... I don't want to come off as, like, vain or anything. It's like, but... Personally? Me? Not really. I mean... I mean, like, I remember for the longest time, like, I didn't want a cell phone. I was given, like, an, a flip phone for my birthday back in high school. And I, I think it was purely for, like, emergency purposes and stuff like that. But, like, I, you know, hid that thing because I didn't want it. And I have evident, and I eventually lost it. I have no idea where that thing went. And then there's, like, like, I've never really cared about you know, what I'm wearing. Like, you know, as long as it's clean it, and neat, like, that's fine. But, like, I've never gone after specific brands or stuff like that, especially those ones where it's like, oh, Supreme, where you're essentially just a walking billboard for an expensive brand that's expensive because it's expensive. Again, that might, that might come down to my Asperger's. Who knows? I'm not a brain scientist. And that is it for now, unfortunately. This is, of course, a part of a much larger reaction, so Link to the Next Part should be appearing, you know, somewhere over my face, as well as uh, in the corner of the video. I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you in the next part. See ya!